Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and virtually all of American Jewry Rabbis, educators, Jewish professionals from every organization, everyone on the American Jewish scene is talking about the Pew Research Center's Portrait of Jewish Americans, which was published October 1st, 2013. The homepage of their website is behind me. Anybody who wishes can just put in Pew Research, Pew Research Center a portrait of Jewish Americans. You can read the entire report. And everyone is asking, is it damning of American Jewry or not? Does it herald an end to American Jewish pluralism or not? Are young American Jews as committed to Jewish tradition, to the state of Israel, to Jewish philanthropy, as were their parents and grandparents? Is the Jewish sky falling or not? And as many sophisticated observers of the Jewish scene rightly point out, statistics can be used to make any point one wishes. And so we'll be spending a good deal of time asking a range of bright thinking Jews to comment on their reactions to some of the findings of the Pew Report. We'll be doing that week after week. And recently, we sat at the offices of B'nai Zion in Manhattan with four individuals who bring unusual insight and perspective to Jewish life in America and to the Pew's portrait of Jewish Americans. First, two most familiar faces for those of you who watch L'Chaim on a regular basis, Dr. Stephen Baim, who heads the American Jewish Committee's Koppelman Institute on American-Jewish-Israeli Relations. And more important for this discussion, Steve is the National Director of the AJC's Contemporary Jewish Life Department, from which he's been in the forefront of issues relating to the workings of the American Jewish community. Micah Halpern, another observer of a multitude of issues confronting Israel and American Jewry, Micah Halpern is the creator of the extremely popular online blog, The Micah Report, and he's the author of the best-selling book, Thugs, which tells the story of some of history's most brutal despots. And then to discuss the 2013 Pew Report, I'm so pleased to be joined by a friend and a member of our panel of commentators, Dr. Stephen M. Cohen, research professor of Jewish social policy at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion and the director of the Berman Jewish Policy Archive at NYU Wagner. And Stephen is recognized throughout the Jewish world as the preeminent researcher and analyst of Jewish demographic studies. And I'm also thrilled to welcome for the first time to L'Chaim, Bethany Horowitz, an assistant professor at NYU's Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development. And again, for this discussion, Bethany brings a wealth of experience for in 1990, as research director for the New York UGA Federation, Bethany designed and conducted the 1991 New York Jewish Population Study and subsequently developed the groundbreaking Connections and Journeys Study, which contrasted Jewish patterns of Jewish baby boomers with younger American Jews. An amazing panel to discuss the Pew Report. And I began by pointing out that the Pew Report chose to define a Jew in two ways. People who said that their religion is Jewish, or number two, people who self-defined as a Jew, who said they consider themselves to be Jewish or partly Jewish, they too were considered to be a Jew for the purposes of this study, provided that they professed no other religious connection. And when we sat together to discuss the Pew Report, Steve Cohen, who was a member of the Jewish Committee which helped create this survey, which ultimately included more than 3,400 respondents, began by explaining why he personally had argued for a different definition of a Jew. 
I was in the minority that actually wanted a more expansive definition that comported with the definition that the UJA Federation gave me and, and, and my colleagues in 2011. And that would have included people who said, I have Jewish parentage, I consider myself Jewish, my religion is Christian. Mm -hmm. We included those people in the New York Jewish Population Study as Jewish. The Pew folks surveyed those people and they allow us to look at them again, but they, they drew the line um, at, with a religious definition. So if you had a definition that, if you self-identified as a, as a Christian or some other religion, not Judaism, or even Judaism and Christianity, and Bethany's work, my work, we're all showing that Jews are adopting often hybrid identities on this and that, things that you couldn't mm -hmm, be together. Mm -hmm. If you had the hybrid identity, the Federation study and many other studies include you. The Pew people, given their research tradition, oh. excluded them as Jewish, but included them in the file for people like Beth and me and myself to, to analyze. As you understand the definition of this study, who a Jew is, were you comfortable with it? Yeah, I think for two reasons. I mean, they're, they're closely related. Number one is the Pew People, Pew Research Center has a, one, a wonderful reputation. And in that respect, uh, they get due deference, that uh, they know what they're doing, they know how to do these surveys, and they, they command a great deal of respect. But second, and I think probably more importantly, uh, America is fundamentally a religious country. And when people perceive Jews, they perceive Jews as this issue of being some religious grouping. If they perceive a Jew who's actually a Christian, in the eyes of America, that person is not a Jew. Bethany, to what extent were you comfortable or uncomfortable by the definition of the Pew Report? I am a social scientist, and uh, I like that they covered the spectrum of connections to Jewishness the way they did. I wouldn't have written the report that way. I think Jewishness is broader than religion, despite the fact that America may view Jews as a Jew, Jews and Judaism as a religious category. I think we are much bigger than that. I think that uh, I understand why they made that call, and uh, I've had to live with that. You know, at Federation, they had too narrow a view, in my view, when I ran the study. But the sociology of it allows us. As long as we're able to survey the people we want to survey and have a data set that then is available to researchers to examine and write more full analyses about, I'm comfortable with it. I, uh, I, by the way, Steve, would not necessarily just on the basis of their reputation accord them anything. The fact is they needed a whole Jewish panel to figure out how to do their study. So they could not have done their work just being Pew. They needed to bring in the expertise yeah, of the Jewish social science. Practice. No, the Jewish social science, though, is it, it, we're, we're a peculiar people. Uh, and they, and they, knew, they knew whom to invite. Yes, but I'm saying it's, not, yeah, and they did. So that, that accrues to their, repu their having, being smart reputationally. But it's not, a, it's not as if Pew did it without any uh, underlying interconnection with the Jewish social science tradition that Steve and I are both part of proudly. If I say to you, that as I read the report, and I can't read it the way you and Steve read it, mm -hmm. I had a feeling that they were talking about Jews as if we were a religious community at all, and that I felt it was n not a conscious decision on their part, almost an organic, out of who they were, mm -hmm. they viewed us in a way that other religious traditions are viewed in America, That's right. but that as a result, some of the things I read didn't feel right to me in terms of how the Jewish community works. And what you're saying is a comfort to me. Do you understand? I, I, I do. OK. All right, how did you feel about the way in which the Pew set up the notion of who is a Jew? I want to first say that I'm glad to be around the table with uh, four other people that actually read the entire study, uh, which is a major problem in discussing it with almost everyone else. Who don't. Who don't. Adam. And uh, reading the coverage of it, which clearly did not, uh, most of the people writing about it, if they did read it, didn't understand it. And that was deeply, deeply troubling. Um, I mean, and, and it was written actually very clearly. <laughs> actually, it was surprisingly for an academic piece. It was actually easy to read. Um, so that's one. Two is I was, I came about, I came with the same discomfort about the way in which Pew viewed the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, it almost felt like a Christianization of mm -hmm. the Jewish people. The reality is, and I'll start this from, this, uh, from the beginning and then I'll answer your question, belief in God is not a central component to Judaism. Mm -hmm. And it's deeply troubling, actually so much so that the amount of ink spilled on 
God in rabbinic literature is minuscule. It is a central component of being a Christian. If you do not believe in God as a Christian, you cannot be a Christian. Okay, how does this answer the question, were you happy with the way in which they define the Jew? Well, I, was, I began by saying how I agree with your discomfort. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a sociological answer, and uh, in determining sociology, you could determine you could create any kind of uh, definition possible for the Jewish uh, okay. definition. Okay. In that way, I don't mind. Okay. It doesn't bother me that okay. they were uh, Jews who don't believe in God, or Jews that believe in other forms of it, but as long as they say, I'm Jewish, okay. I, I accept that. Pick, I, I wouldn't pick. necessarily, the last category that you said, though, I would agree also is a problem. If you say I'm Jewish and you actually go in and, and want people to convert to Christianity, that already uh, is, uh, is a different issue. This study makes an enormous distinction between what they call a Jew with religion and a Jew without religion or with no religion. And it, it was very hard for me to get my head around what they were talking about. According to this study, I think I understood, it said 22% of the Jews who were Jews for this study, 20% of Jews had no religion. And the question is, what did they mean by no religion? Because it wasn't, a, lo and behold, of those 22%, many of them belonged to synagogues. Sure had a strong affili affiliation with an affinity for being Jewish. And again, this is an example where it jarred me. What do you understand this 22% to represent? Can I the, jump in? Sure, yeah. please, Bethany. I, I think there's a, there's a bigger context, which is that in studies of religion in America, and Steve earlier said, Steve Bame earlier said about how America is a religious country, the biggest thing that's been going on in America, the fastest growing religious group in America is the one that we sociologists call nuns. And we don't mean with habits. We mean N-O-N-E. -E. And that's been growing at a faster rate than evangelical in the past. I don't, I don't remember what Robert Putnam reported three, recently. Three percent in the Eisenhower years, 20 percent in the last study. So against that background, the study of religion in America must include people who say they have no religion. And what, think about how these studies are conducted. You basically get a phone call. Hello, can you tell me your religion? Jewish, okay, you're in the study. Hello, can you tell me your religion? I don't have a religion. Do you consider yourself Jewish? Yes, then you're a Jew without religion. That's what that comes down to. So the, actually, in, in this study, as opposed to the studies, con, study conducted 12 years ago called the National Jewish Population Study, they, they began by asking what is your religion, and then named several religions. The NJPS, Natural Jewish Population Study, had, a, had an open answer. It turns out that if you name the religions, you actually get more Jews. Um, so but you're forcing a choice, and one of the choices not is not forcing, you're, you're providing a choice. But one of them is not no religion. And then one of them is agnostic, like, atheist, no okay. religion. So people could say, hearing a, some people hearing a religion question answer no religion. And uh, then, if we don't, if they didn't know who, who was, and then getting a, any answer, mm -hmm. aside from mm -hmm. Judaism, including Christian, by the way, they would then ask the question, do you consider yourself Jewish? At that point, the people who said no religion, I, I'm an atheist or I'm an agnostic, um, had a chance to say that I'm Jewish. And those are the so-called people with no religion. It, the, it the turns religion, the Jew into a religious categorization, and, and we aren't religious. Well, I, I agree with you, and I and I, uh, I, I would I'm willing to say that of all the, the consultants, I was the strongest proponent mm -hmm. of an ethnic definition, mm -hmm. the strongest strongest person resisting the pew respected scholarly tradition of looking at looking at people in general religiously. On, and, and they move considerably to, to appreciate not only myself and many other people on, on the panel who, who advise them. Incidentally, I think everybody at this table acknowledges that a Jew can be an agnostic. A Jew can be an atheist. And when a Jew is asked, are you, do you have a religion? And they are you Jewish? No, I'm an atheist. It's, they're not the same category of being. And I want to know, as you saw this whole religious question, 22% of the Jewish community is not religious, or ha no, has no religion. How did you interpret that, and what does it mean to you? I think the importance of that is, to me, the follow-up question, and here's where the data becomes so valuable, is what is their degree of activity in terms of Jewish affairs? And there, the distinction between Jews by religion and Jews of no religion is enormous. 
So the conclusion I draw is that basically, again, it's not a theological conclusion about religion being good or belief in God being good, although I happen to think both those things are true. The, the conclusion I draw is that the core of the community remains those who have some kind of Judaism is my religion, mm -hmm. whether I go to church or go to synagogue or not. Self-identified. By yeah. the way, the group that does, says they have no religion affiliates with synagogues. They go to synagogues. In much smaller numbers. Yes, yes, that's true. Okay. But it's not like they don't. The tw it's not and like that's why I said I don't regard it as a theological right. statement. Okay. I do regard it as a statement about what is the level of Jewish activity. Every one of those categories, Orthodox, conservative, reform, and go on and on, those are should be known as people who on a quick 15-second question answered when asked, I'm conservative. Do they read Salman Shachter? Are they closely aligned with, with, with Rama and, 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 uh, and the, and the, and the, and the, Salman, and the Shachter day schools? And do they, do they know before whom they stand on Shabbos morning? Not some, but not all. Okay. And so we have to look at all these as fuzzy, quick okay. then kind of, kind of okay. characterizations. And, and now we now go to the substance for me. Then what do I, what, where do you learn something, mamash, really of significance? And where has the way this was crafted, and I understand how hard it is when I hear you describe it. I, was, I wish I were in the room when I heard the discussion, because no, it you sounds fascinating. <laughs> no? It sounds interesting to me. No, it, 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 you're, it okay. sounds fascinating to me. But then I say to myself, then what am I learning here? How do I know what I'm le learning here? Stephen, how do I know what I'm learning? I think there are parts of the study that, that are very compelling and solid. Other parts are suggestive. I think the birth rates, are probably if you ask somebody, have you had a child, they actually, it's not, it's not perfect. They generally know the answer to that question. Any number, number of children, stillborn, I mean, the tragic circumstances, adoptions, do I count this? So there's some fuzziness, but it's much better than, are you orthodox or serve reform, so forth and so on. Um, and, and also, are you, as we see, are you Jewish? So we just need to, to apply different levels of doubt and skepticism to the various straightforward findings that are reported. And they're very good about reporting the facts, but not, but, but not going too far with interpretation. Okay. Is there anything about the Pew study which, when you read, surprised you and surprised you in a negative way? I would say uh, the thing that most surprised me was the, the intermarriage issue that seems to have been plateaued. And um, it's certainly within the conservative movement, I had expected it to be a much higher level and uh, fell in the 27%, which very much pleased me. Um, uh, certainly, Chapter 3 discusses, uh, discusses that in question. And um, we should point out, by the way, yeah. if I read it correctly, yeah. I, in, I the year two, in the year in 2000, the rate of intermarriage in the Jewish community overall was 58%. Yes. And in 2013, it's 58%. Yeah. I think it's plateaued. That's what I'm suggesting. I, I'm surprised. I mean, I thought it was 47% in 2000. If it plateaued, it plateaued at nearly 6 out of 10 to say nothing of the fact that if you take the highly in-marrying Orthodox out of the equation and leave yourselves just with the non-Orthodox, which is like a lot of people, most Jews, the rate goes up to 71.5%. Now, if that, th that surprised me. Just so our audience knows, the Pew study showed that in the Jewish community, roughly 10% of the Jews who were in this study in some way were categorized as Orthodox. Just, just to refine that, 10% of the adults, and they didn't report, the and I asked them, yeah. what percent of children are Orthodox? The answer is 23%. So they're over twice as many children who are Orthodox as there are adults who are Orthodox, owing to the fact that the Orthodox birth rate is more than twice that of non-Orthodox Jews. Okay. I still don't understand how you can talk about plateauing, though, which even, even assuming a high plateau, if it was 47% for Jews who got married between 1995 and, and 2000, and it's 58% for Jews who got married between 2005 and 2010. But it was 58% also between 2000 and 2005. That's the sense of plateau. In 2000, it was 58%. 13 years ago. And it's still 58%. In 13 years, it has not increased. I found that to be surprising. It shocked me. And I think it's somewhat of a Talmudic distinction, frankly. Look, uh, when it reached 50% back in the 1990s, or a little bit less, 
some of us were saying then that, well, the good news is, is that it may plateau because whoever wants to marry out currently can marry out, and therefore half the population is choosing Jewish partners. So the fact that it's gone up to 58%, to me, is hardly a plateau. Now, it suggests that the overall arc continues to ascend, notwithstanding predictions that we reached a certain plateau. So I take no comfort from this. There is another angle on it, uh, which is that if you're looking sociologically at the very small minority the Jews occupy in a very large majority of American others, the, nat the, nat the sort of mathematical uh, I, I don't know what the amount is, but if it was a, if Jews didn't care about marrying one another, it would be a much higher rate right. by just the chance of sneezing on another Jew. Maybe in New York we would always have more Jewish marriages mm -hmm. because there are more Jews here. But if you spread, if Jews are spread around according to the mathematics, it should be much higher. It should be in the 80s or more percent. Are you I, saying in some way 58 percent? It could be is viewed good? as a, a sense of choice of some. I don't know if it's choice or uh, uh, it's beyond chance. It suggests the, a Jewish communal preference or at least for in marriage. It, it, it could be any number most, of things. Most Jews still prefer to have Jewish partners. That is of and, some and that's and, that, and that's different from other groups. The study also concludes, which gave me some hope also, uh, was that products of these intermarriages were choosing to be Jewish also. I didn't see that. And. Um, some. Uh, I, yeah. didn't, I didn't see it. Mostly not. But I, I mostly them. not, though. Oh, wait, what I either. see here is that among couples where both are Jewish, they're raising their children as Jews at a rate of 96%. And it says that if it's an intermarried couple, it's roughly 20%. No, I, what you're quoting is not the number who are raising their kids as Jews. You were quoting the column that said Jews by religion. There are people who are being raised Jewish other than religion. It's a very significant column. It's meaningful that people, that the two Jewish parents, 96% of the time, say, my kid is Jewish and in the Jewish religion. The, almost all the others say, my kid is Jewish, but uh, no religion, and something, something like that. Among the intermarried, mm -hmm. the, the people who are saying Jewish in any kind of way, it turns out to be 63%. Somehow, 37%. But they, only 20% say Jewish by religion. The others, Jewish and Christian, nothing and Jewish, Jews no religion, uh, some mixture. So fewer Jews come out of intermarried households. We know from another part of the study of people who've already grown up, of those with one Jewish parent, 43% of them identify as Jews. Of people who are in the 43%, 83% marry non-Jews, much higher than than others. The result is that if you do the math, if you put all these numbers together, and we, we, can't, do, we can't roll the cameras forward to, to 2070, but if you look at the grandchildren of the intermarried, you multiply all the numbers out, 8% of the grandchildren are going to marry Jews. If it's linear. If it's linear, nothing Which changes. Is a big assumption. The world always changes. The future is very hard to predict, especially when it's very far ahead. Yes, 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 yes. The grandchild but of Karl Marx is a settler on the West Bank. I mean, it's, come on. It's Trotsky. Trotsky, it's Trotsky whatever. It's Trotsky. But it's Trotsky. 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 Karl Marx would be funnier. Karl Marx would be funnier. The reality is, I'm not happy with the intermarriage rate. I'm not happy that they intermarry. I'm not happy with the products that happens as a result of that. That's for sure. But that's not just a personal issue, that's, a personal, that's an issue with regard to the question of the future of the Jewish community. With regard to the study, though, I was shocked. I thought that people who intermarried were gone, lost, all of them, 100%. Where did you, where'd you, where'd you, where'd you come up with that? Uh, that uh, not Bethany's uh, research, not no, my research. No, but it's anecdotally. Historically, in, previ also, in, previous, in previous eras, that's if a, you were a long gone. time ago. Well, no, no, but, no, no, no but the not, fact not is the, the image, the Im look. Let me, I would like to finish what I was saying. If you, if you look in previous eras, people who intermarried didn't want their kids to be Jewish. So they might have stayed Jewish, but their kids were surely raised Christian. The thing that's remarkable is that we have a shelf life that's holding, or a, a half-life, whatever. The, the endurance I think this is, is called grasping at straws. Look, I fully empathize with the... Uh, desire on the part of Jewish parents to want to have Jewish grandchildren. I fully understand that uh, when uh, an intermarriage takes place, one should not give up hope. My hope would actually be for conversion of the non-Jewish spouse, in which case I really think we are gaining people. Um, but I certainly understand why those, can, those people can look at their grandchildren and say, well, he's about 10% Jewish, so therefore, as far as I'm concerned, he's Jewish. 
frankly, I've had people who've had 0% Jewish, and they still say, my grandchildren are as Jewish as you could possibly imagine. I understand that desire. The question is, in terms of Jewish communal planning, these are not people on which one can stake the Jewish future on. And in that respect, the news about mixed marriage is not at all comforting. Go back to the 20% figure. You have one in five mixed marrieds who are making the claim that they're raising their children only as Jews. Well, that to me is the best news, if you will. Short of conversion, it's the best news. Um, however, realize all it is, they're making a claim. The question is what's going to happen when they reach adulthood. But I'm saying, let that claim stand for now. Those are the ones I really embrace and say, great, let's keep on going with that. The thing that's changed, and I was trying to make this point, that the uh, admirability of being Jewish, the, 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 sh the credit rating of being Jewish, is so entirely different now than it was in any other time in American How history. So? That, uh, well, we all remember when, let's say, Madeleine Albright discovered that her father, both her parents were Jewish. In another era, that would have been a source of shame. What era? Uh, 30 years before. 19, I don't. In 1940s. 1964. That's not, that's not 30 years ago. Good. 1964. Before the 1960s, for sure. That's can, a long time ago. Can I, can that's 50 yes. years. Can I that's 50 years. Yes, that's so, 50 give, years. Yes, but I want to make, I'm, I'm I wanna make give, that kind of point. But, that's, but you want to contrast Jewish life now with 50 years ago? I think we have to do that. Because I think that Steve well, wants I, I, to I, contrast it with 1990. I think we can do several contrasts, but we need to go and make I want to weigh in on the slide of Bethany, and I want to give it back to the floor. I have a little, I have a little index card. <laughs> 1964, National Study of Americans, American ethnic right, groups, right. Jews rank last uh, below Portuguese and Italians in, in, in admiration. Of ahead, of, ahead of Puerto Ricans. Being admired or? Uh, a social distance scale is called, it, whether you like Jews, I forget okay. the exact term. Okay. 2009, Robert Putnam does a study of religious groups, a little bit different, but Steve Baim is right. America now views Jews as religion. And Jews, national study, 2% of the population. We get ranked number one. So I asked Robert Putnam when, while he was eating a bagel near JTS, I said, Bob, why, why did Jews move from the, the, the lowest ranked white group to the highest ranked religious group in, in my lifetime? He said, because we're richer, we're smarter, and we're funnier than other <laughs> Americans. We haven't gotten to the humor question yet. <laughs> Beth, Bethany, continue because you're definitely on the right track. You and I read the same literature. The idea that being Jewish is an attractive prize or something that you might reach for with all these people who have a little bit of ingredients, whether it's 10% or 100%, makes it a more pride, you know, something that you might be proud to be part of and it might attract people. And you're talking about Jews being more proud of being I'm Jewish? I'm certain. We saw that anyway in the study. I'm talking about, we were talking the image about of Jews the inter in America. We were talking about children of intermarriage and what might become of them. Steve was saying, I can count on the people, the 20% whose parents said that they're Jewish through and through, and I can't count on the rest of them. And I'm saying that maybe, you, you, I, do, I don't agree with that. I think there's a lot more variability. Uh, it's not linear that people have, and it's not a stack. I got it. What's your the, response? The, the, My okay. response is twofold, Bethany. I fully agree with you about the image of Jews in America. And if you want to look about good news in this study, it's that, yes, America has been incredibly hospitable to Jews. No society in diaspora Jewish history has been as open to Jewish participation. Why Jews remember the Holocaust as being the key element in their Jewish identity, to me, is a sad commentary. But the image of Jews in America is incredibly high. And obviously, that opens the door. And that's why I think a program that is more receptive and more encouraging of conversion is one of the policies, I think, that would emanate from this study, the single best outcome to work for is the conversion of the non-Jewish spouse. And in that respect, that's a communal policy that I would uh, not only embrace, I, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be advocating it. You wrote it. And I wrote it, right, exactly. I think, uh, it's, it's, I think it's an extreme, though. I, I don't, and I think it's actually a, a religious description of people joining the Jewish community. I think one can join the Jewish community, and hence we see this not just in the study, by just joining. Right. One need not right. convert. And conversion becomes a religious question again. I think that one of the great elements of the Jewish community today in America says, no, we can be a Jew by choice, which is a convert, let's say, for instance, or we can just join the community, pay our dues, send our kids, uh, um, uh, become leaders, and you'll go throughout America and you'll find leaders in Jewish communities who are products of intermarriages or intermarried themselves um, and deeply involved and entrenched Again, in that society. Again, no, there's no comparing Jews by choice, conversionary Jews, if you will, 
uh, to uh, people who essentially say, um, I'm, join I'm coming along, I'm joining a Jewish institution or I'm joining a Jewish group. Every comparison that's been done always indicates that uh, those who have converted to Judaism look like the in-married Jews. Those who have not, their level of participation is about half as much. Now here's an interesting thing that will join what appears to be a fissure and that is that, and it, it, let me start with the parentheses. The study, the Pew study is a snapshot. It captures something at one moment in time. It doesn't tell us anything about process in a person's life. And it is certainly the case that there is a large number of people that are sort of uh, in the aura around the Jewish community. Around, uh, you know, we see it in synagogues that there's family and friends who themselves may not be Jewish by religion. They might have whatever, they, they're fr fellow travelers. But if you have a sense of process over time, one could still hold that a very desired outcome might be that people would eventually choose Jewishness or Judaism. Uh, absolutely, uh, and, Bethany. And, but, but, so one of the things that happens, though, is with these snapshots, it looks like we then split the population, and it's this group and that group, and it creates well, all kinds of... The reason I have of, a problem with it is the only no, way to convert is through synagogue and religious life. Well, no, one can ju join the Jewish community in a lot of other different ways. Right, and we don't and have that to have a convert. To be we one don't... of the failures of American Jewish I, community I today is too. religion yeah. and Jewish life. There's that? the Jewish life issue within the synagogue. Do you think that's a failure of Jewish life? That basically the way you join the Jewish people is through a religious conversion? Yeah, I don't consider it a failure. I, I've, I've circulated a proposal to create a, a non-religious conversion program, a non-religious affirmation program. I'm going to leave the word conversion up to Yossi Balin and I sat. One Shabbat morning in his house, and he told me that he was in Tel Aviv, and he said he was upset that 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 the, the, he asked the question, why should an agnostic Christian have to go to a rabbi in order to become an agnostic Jew? And he's right. That's correct. So, in the New York study, we found that there are a hundred Jewish adults, twenty of them are Orthodox. I, I, I want to remind us how many Orthodox there are in New York. Of the eighty, seven had no Jewish parents. Of the, of, the, of the seven who came to being Jewish, two converted, and five, kind of echoing Bethany's comment about fluidity and the attraction of being Jewish, five out of the seven said, I'm Jewish, and there's no, and did you convert? No. Why are you Jewish? My grandchild is Jewish. My ex-husband was Jewish. Another one said something a little different. My, my, I'm Jewish with my father. I'm Christian with my mother. So we have all kinds of fluidity and hybridity that we didn't have before. So I agree with you. It would be a wonderful thing to bring non-Jews into the fold, especially if they're married to Jews, so that we can have more Jewish children. Ha However, in the interest of communal unity and so forth and so on, we have so many other things that we should be doing right now. Um, I have backed off of this plan. I I'm, I'm, on, I'm in public. I've, I've written about it. And I, and I, I think that that politically it would be uh, unhelpful to the Jewish people at this point to get distracted by this, um, uh, quote, innovative or wacky idea, I'm not sure which it is, that we have so much to do within the fold, uh, that things that we can, people can get, get, on, get on board on to meet the challenge of the, what I believe to be the rapidly dwindling, engaged, non-Orthodox population. We have not yet gotten to the point, of, give me just two more minutes, if you, or maybe a minute and a half, very basic, very basic sound bites here. We have seven million people in the population who have a Jewish parent, who are, who are, who are, who are adults. Five million of them identify as Jews. That's the 5.3, some, some kind of us. Two million of them. Two million people with a Jewish parent do not think they're Jewish today. Why isn't this a tragedy? At my minion on Friday night, when the people ask, well, who, who, you say, who do you want to say a Meshaberach for? I, will, I, have, I have something. I want to say a mishaberach for American Jewry. We are very sick. We just learned in the last few weeks that we've lost two million souls. That's horrible. That's, that's a sickness. That's an illness. One, hold, hold that on the side. That, that is in, un, incontrovertible. Second, 71% of non-Orthodox Jews are marrying non-Jews. The, the, the fertility rate is 1.7. We need 2.1 to stay even a loss of 20% in one generation. Of the 1.7, some of those people are going to be raising non-Jewish kids. If you do the arithmetic, 
one, uh, 43% that are, uh, take, take the most optimistic numbers. The most optimistic number I can come up with is that the non-Orthodox population produces 1.2 Jewish children in the next generation as compared with 2.1 what's necessary for continuity. Feels like a 40% decline in the next generation. Why don't we see this? This is not, this is more dramatic and more immediate and closer than climate change. It's here, it, it, it came. We spoke about it in 1990, we spoke about it in the year 2000, we now have really incontrovertible evidence from all the different studies over time across the different communities that, we are in, that we're not necessarily declining the Jewish population, we're declining that part of the population which is associated with, call it conventional Judaism, if we create a different ways of being Jewish that doesn't necessarily involve Israel or Jewish organizations or synagogues, or, then it's possible Judaism will revive so forth and so on. But if we're talking about Judaism as more or less we know it, all right, not with American Jewish Congress, not with, Amer not with B'nai B'rith, not with Yiddish, I understand. But more or less, that population that's not Orthodox is in rapid decline right now. I don't care, I want you to, to what extent are you comfortable with not only the analysis, but in essence, the therefore that Steve gives you. Steve Cohen always makes me very comfortable. I mean, that's a, first of all, give him credit. He's led the charge in all this. Okay, so let me, you, know, yeah. you agree with him that you that like there to be, you see no reason why an agnostic Christian should be converted by an agnostic. Wait, wait, so he backed off that position. I did not. That. No, you I did, did not. Yes, no, did. you did not. I what did, you I said did. was, it was, it's not strategic. Not con you don't, you didn't back off of it on a principle. You said, I can't get my way right now. Strategic is a principle. Okay, and, and once he backed off it, I felt extremely comfortable. Yeah, but that's not fair. No, it is fair. No, it is not. You're, you're in your best, the best ideal world for you, no. there's no reason why an agnostic Christian has to be converted by a rabbi to become an agnostic Jew. And Beth me says, yeah, right on. After I don't get it. No, Boy, but, I don't, but and Mar I, Mar and I'm, I'm still in agreement. No, with no, Steve. no. I, no, I need you to answer I'm, that. I'm answering it. Okay. Are you comfortable general, with? Are you comfortable with his ideal that there's no reason for an agnostic Christian? to be converted by a rabbi to become an agnostic you're, you're, Jew. You're, you're misstating my ideal. Right. And you're I, misstating I my assent. So I, I have it on tape. No, you're misstating, you're misstating my assent, my though, which is, is that I believe that with Chok Hashvut, the law of return, that there are all sorts of people that are eligible to do that, but then to make them go through conversion in this way. Well, that's not he. Well, no, it, but that's, he was talking about no. Yossi Balin's point, and my, that is part of his point. Well, yeah. I, I do I, have a very straightforward answer. In general, I'm in favor of lowering barriers to conversion. Yep, I want a conversion good. policy that is encouraging of conversion. Good. The specific question that Steve raises of can we have secular conversion, I say yes, it is innovative. To some extent it is wacky. It is clearly divisive within the Jewish world. Mm -hmm. And therefore I'd say, Steve, drop it, tell Yossi Balin, well-intentioned, but no, that's now that's is not tactics. the right time for it. That's tactics. Yeah. But and that's why you, I said I'm comfortable yes, with, with it. Yes, both of you, all three of us here, are you, do you agree? All three, or is it four? I, began, I just are I all began. Four, I was the one who started this so discussion. All four, no, no, no. Way, I, I need the, the way, caveat here. I need the caveat. I, I, I don't like the, the the way in which it was expressed, because I don't think whether you're agnostic or atheist have anything to do with whether you're a Jew or Fine. not. This I do a, want some kind of conversion ceremony that somebody doesn't have to profess a belief in God or a love of specific things in the Torah. But I want there to be a conversion ceremony. Yeah. And he so does he. All right. He just wants a secular one. No, I don't think so necessarily. I you think don't that think? here, here's, um, I need a caveat here. I started the whole discussion and I'm happy I did. The point is that the reality is we're talking about the sociology of the Jewish people here and not a halachic definition of what a Jew is. And I think it has to be absolutely clear. As a halachic Jew, I need to make that distinction sure. also. I need to say, I am perfectly comfortable with the Jewish community being fluid. That's the case. It's got to be fluid in order to gain. I recognize also that one can change the parameters of a study and suddenly get a few million extra people, or a few hundred thousand also, and call them Jews. And we've lost two million of those people that we might call Jews because we changed the parameters also. And I understand that too. So it's a, that, that's a problem in our, in our understanding. That said, I'm an elitist. And as an elitist, I want Judaism to grow in the most exciting, dynamic way. And I want it to be a magnet for people to come and join us. I want the Jewish community to be that way. The reality is that when people want to join, we shouldn't say, don't, because you don't have these things. Right. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the Orthodox world that only grows because of it. 
Okay, as a member of the Orthodox community, I'm very comfortable saying, let other parts of Judaism grow too. What's the problem? And this is a deep discussion with regard to the challenge of conversion. So I don't really care that there's uh, that there are uh, uh, specific uh, secular elements of joining or, or uh, secular humanistic Judaism is enormously successful. And it's it is. Judaism it's without... Enormously well, successful. No, and within its, it's, its environment, it's, it's, it's engaging, yes. its discussions are very... Capital H humanistic or yeah. humanistic? No, it's a, it's a, it has a movement which is making an impact. It has a literature. Sherman Wine. Sherman Wine, exactly. Yeah. One, con one, con one grows which, congregation in Detroit. And so, yeah. How many um, other congregations are there? We, I, would, I would argue... Yeah. But you most, certainly want different strokes Jews for different folks, so whatever would be possible. American Jews do not have the kind of faith system that you're talking about where they would not be called humanist. They're not humanists, but they're definitely, definitely humanistic. Mark, we, I, we, 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 we uncovered an issue of principle. That's what I'm putting off the table. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a very learned Jew, but I, I seem to remember the rabbi said, you don't make a halacha, a Jewish law, that the population can't follow. That's right. And that's the position of ideal. And when I said, I had an idea, I tried it out, and I found out that the Jewish population at this point can't follow it, it's not that I, it's not, I'm not being strategic by withdrawing it. I'm saying it's the wrong idea. If the Jewish people don't want it, this idea, there, since, since there are other ways to get to where we want to go, okay. it's the wrong idea. It's not just in, not strategic. The vast, um, vast majority of Jews want it. There is a very serious problem with those who don't, and it would create a schism. But the vast majority of Jews would embrace what you're saying overwhelmingly. I think, I think they'll do it anyway. I think for the reasons that Bethany cited, we're going to get people. We are getting people who, want to be, who will become Jewish without a formal ceremony. Okay. I'm, I'm undercutting my own proposal as a matter of ideal. And I want to say that I know that we have many other ways to address these problems, like youth groups and camps. And, uh, and Israel travel, and conversion, and, 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 and film festivals, and preschool centers, and making America family friendly. There are numerous things that we can do that can increase the chances that we'll have more non-Orthodox engaged Jewish grandchildren. And those policies will obtain the support of the people who have to invest in them. Why should I undercut that platform with an idea that's going to divide them. It okay. makes no sense. I love it's wrong. I, I love what you say. It. I'm going to ask you something. I don't want to know why or what. I just want to know a yes or no. <laughs> it's a short answer Does part the of the Pew okay. study convince you that Jews are fleeing faith traditions? Fleeing is a very strong word, Mark. I mean, <laughs> does the Pew study cause me dismay that we're losing two million Jews? Yes, absolutely. Fleeing, uh, fleeing faith tradition is a very strong word. Does the Pew study suggest to you that Jews are fleeing faith traditions? I think that it's overstated, and it's overstated Again, I'm doing this historical comparison that at an earlier yes. time, Jews didn't want, you wouldn't have found the Jews in a study who said they're still got some Jewish background. People would have hidden that. Okay. And so I, I'm not worried in that way. All right, all and, right. uh, I the, and then the faith traditions piece, I think that Jews have a, a mixed relation. They have multiple ways that they identify as Jewish. Yes. And whether it's all religion, it, that part I think is... Uh, the, the Pew study shows that that's not the case, the peop th that people have other ways of connecting. For you, does the Pew study show that Jews are fleeing faith traditions? No. For you, oh. does it show that religious movements can't hold on to their members? No. How about you? Does the Pew study you, you show... You did pick up the contradiction, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. That's what sure. <laughs> we'll come back to it. Does the study in your mind, Micah, suggest that Jews are fleeing the faith tradition? I take all of these studies with a grain of salt. I just want to know yes or no. I think they're interesting. They're interesting to talk about. Are Jews fleeing their faith tradition? There is assimilation on the one hand, and there are people coming to Judaism on the other. And are religious movements this. unable to hold on to their members from, based on this study? At the same way, there are people that are running away from Judaism and running away, I, I would I'd rather say, running to the world that's around them, and then there are people who are coming to Judaism. Okay. Are the boundaries that separate Jew and Christian blurring? Yes. Are the boundaries that separate Jews and Christians blurring? I think they're changing, but yes, they're probably blurring in some very clear regards. 
but, but there, I think there are other boundaries that are emerging, but mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's as sharp. So I, I would say I would lean in the direction of, yes, blurring. How are they blurring? Why blurring? It suggests that you, it's not as clear to an individual whether they are a Jew or a Christian? Well, the, the whole idea that there's a separate identity called Jewish that's separate from Christian has come under increasing empirical assault. In other words, we have many more people, we have many people who this table would regard as Jewish, who have, who have affinity with Christianity, who, are, have, non, who have Christian parents, and Christian family, um, who celebrate Christian holidays. And the other side, we have many people who we all regard as entirely non-Jewish. And for the reasons that Beth Mee alerted us to a little while ago, who are saying, uh, either I admire being Jewish, or even more, and they're in the Pew study, uh, I, I am partially Jewish because Jesus was a Jew, or because Jews have a lot to teach me, or because my Christianity is a, is a descendant of, the, of, of Judaism. That's blurring. All right. So I'm asking you the same question. That's blurring, that's blurring on the side of Christian, people who have some Christian background uh, feeling an affinity to Jewishness, but it may not be reciprocated on the part of people who are Jewish only looking at how, mm -hmm. where the right. boundary is. Right. The, that's a good point. There, there are two doors. Yeah, it's two way, but the, but the boundaries may not be exactly okay. the same. All right, Steve, you deal with this. That, it's one of the things you deal with all the time. The, do you see a blurring between Jew and Christian? Look, I've, I've talk, spoken about blurring for 20 years, since the 1990 population study came out. And my comment then was that uh, a minority such as the Jews, as, as positive as, as blurring is about how America is so open to Jewish participation, as positive as that is, for minorities such as the Jews to survive, a tiny minority, it requires Judaic distinctiveness. Mm -hmm. Judaic distinctiveness does mean stronger boundaries. And in that sense, this kind of fluidity is not great news for Jewish continuity. It's great news about America, because it says America's working as a democracy. Anyway, the forward had these headlines. And one of the things you said early on was that very often all Jews are reading is secondary sources that are commenting on the Pew study. If I am just a Jew getting the forward and I look at new study finds Jews fleeing faith traditions, there's a message there which I don't think is reflected in the actual details of the Pew study. Religious movements can't hold on to their members. I think that there's a very different message being conveyed here. And I'm only mentioning this because one of the things that all four of you do all the time is try to clarify for the Jewish community what is and is not the reality. One of the things that I really wanted to hear from you was whether as you see this study, is the sky falling? And you know what Steve said, and I don't think he's, he, he certainly doesn't hope for it, and he's not necessarily saying it has to happen, but he is seeing trends that really give him enormous concern about the Jewish future, especially as you describe it, the non-Orthodox Jewish future in America. By the way, we're presuming that the Orthodox uh, population has nobody leaving. Yes, I understand. And so, there I was mean, some it's a presumption that, that it's staying, you're Orthodox, there. you're once Orthodox, always By Orthodox. By the way, the study we'll said... We'll take 17%. We'll take them. We, the, the study said it was it, for older Jews it was 50 percent, but not under age 30. Yes, but you know what? When I, I asked the, the deputy director of the Pew study, did you ask those people at what point they left? He said, "No, I have no idea when they left. You have no idea when they left. All I know is more the research. older the older they are, the, the more, more they leave." Left, okay, yeah. but anyway, I want to know from you: Do you see this study as in some way a wake-up call to the American Jewish community that says you have to you really have to do some creative thinking here does this study say to you the Jewish sky is falling in America well there are certainly things to worry about and Steve articulated them very well but I'm an optimist I would not hedge uh, or pull back on that at all I'm not just an optimist because of the Orthodox growth I'm an optimist because we have a spectacular product and I have a tremendous amount of faith. Didn't we have a spectacular profit product for the last 30 years? No, it was a different environment. We had a lot more anti-Semitism then. It was much harder to... I don't think um, there's been too much anti-Semitism in the last 60 years. It, well, uh, no, actually, I would say in the last uh, two decades, 
there's been a tremendous drop in... And that was going on since 1945. But the admirability but, thing I was talking about, I think that, that has clear, been That's been increased. That's increased. Years, one, is, that's one, one could be a part different. of the Jewish community, and one need not... And one could leave also on their own, because one can freely leave the Jewish community. But the product is so good, and people are coming in and they're joining it. And I've got to tell you also, the Jewish community was, is, a, an, is a community which embraces people who get excited about involvement. And the Orthodox community certainly, but the non-Orthodox community also. And when people get involved, they do great things. Why and I'm going to say that there's going to be a, there's going to be a ripple report. effect there. The reality what is, in the Pew report count? substantiates what you're saying. Well, I'm worried about uh, none. My point nothing. is nothing. The point is the Pew report is talking about the the uh, periphery all the time. I'm not interested in the periphery. Ultimately, we had a discussion about the periphery. Those numbers, all those numbers. The reality is I'm interested in the core, and the core is solid. The core is exciting. Um, USY and Ramah are doing remarkable things educationally. The Jewish uh, day school movement, non-Orthodox Jewish day school movement, is burgeoning. It's exciting. I it's heard the opposite. How many have closed? I've we heard saw the opposite. Schools have closed that they're closing years. right and left. Yeah. They have no yeah. money. I mean, that's the... I think, again, you're speaking theology, not, not, uh, not the sociological fact. The evidence might not support my thesis, yes. and I accept that. That doesn't necessarily mean that I'm not optimistic and the core is not solid. And I want that to be clear. And it's not because I'm, I'm uh, living in Never Never Land. I really believe in an excitement in the Jewish world. I also know full well that there is atrophy. And that's okay in a certain way. It's okay to atrophy. Um, and we can't cry about it all the time. We have to really focus. And running after people who are not necessarily central or don't want to be a part of our community is not necessarily an answer. We have to give people who want to be a part of our community all the tools that enable them participation. And we should drop the, 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 the barriers that prevent them from joining it. That's all. And I think that if we do that, then we'll have, uh, I think, an exciting and dynamic future. I really believe that. For you, does this study suggest the sky is falling? Look, I like to take the uh, perspective of the, uh, the gaze of the historian. And uh, I do go back to 1990 because that's, uh, you know, that to me was the, um, the seminal moments. We had an opportunity at that time with the release of the NJPS, we had an opportunity that everyone was saying Jewish continuity is the priority. Um, we were benefited from the Oslo years, the optimism that went with that, mm -hmm. that said we could tend to our internal, internal homes. But the bottom line is, despite, despite enormous hoopla, uh, the only real thing that came out of the 1990 population study in terms of policy was birthright. Mm -hmm. The birthright has been a successful program. But at that said, some of the data in terms of this, in terms of young people's attitudes to Israel is, is troubling. But the real point is, is that very little was done in terms of the kinds of things Steve Cohen is, is speaking about. What I spoke about then was the issue about adolescence and, uh, and high school education. No, Salman Schechter high schools have not burgeoned. Matter of fact, there are very few left in the country. Um, so in that sense, 1990 to me was the real wake up call. Pew, with all of its ambivalence of things that we might have, we might Ambiguity. have ambiguities that we might want to see done differently, Pew provides an opportunity, not for complacency and say, well, it's not really as bad as people make it out to be. Uh, Pew provides a challenge to the community of what are your real priorities? What are, you really, what are you really worried about? Are you worried primarily about anti-Semitism that is non-existent in America? Are you worried about that the Holocaust might be forgotten, which is uh, you know, clearly the, uh, uh, one of the headlines coming out of this, that 73% feel the Holocaust is so central to their identity? Or is the real message that if the Jews do not assert their, um, their sense of um, priority in terms of Jewish education and the network of activities that go along with it, both formal and informal, including trips to Israel and things that, uh, that enhance the Jewish world, um, if we don't do that, I foresee a Jewish community that will suffer further attrition. I don't know whether the sky will be falling, because uh, here I think Micah is, is, re is relying upon a certain uh, covenantal imperative that God promised Abraham the Jews would never disappear. I wish I had that kind of faith, and to some extent I do, in the sense that I, I keep up with this entire business. But if we take this study seriously, it really should be the wake-up call that should have happened 25 years ago, and regrettably Jewish leadership did not rise to the occasion. What could they have done? I think they could have made day school education free. I think they could have invested heavily in Jewish summer camping. Uh, I think they should have focused particularly upon the adolescent years, which I think are the critical years in terms of Jewish socialization, friendship networks, and value formation. In other words, what, what's worthwhile about all of this business? 
a number of things were done that are very exciting. I think probably that's what, what Micah draws some comfort from, things like Limud, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, hundreds, thousands of people learning Jewish texts together. All that is very wonderful, good, exciting. I participate in it. But what I'm really concerned about is will we bring a level of intensity uh, among the next generation of Jews that has sustained the Jewish community for quite some time. And uh, here I venture to say we're talking about a large number of Jews who are relatively indifferent. That doesn't mean they're gone. It doesn't mean we should write them off. And it doesn't mean they have no interest in anything Jewish. But it does mean that to what extent can we speak about the fate of the Jewish people being entrusted into the hands of people whose level of care is sim simply doesn't have the kind of passion and dedication mm -hmm. that uh, the Jewish community requires. And one more question, then we'll let anybody else answer. Steve points out that outside of the Orthodox community, the intermarriage rate is really above 70%. It's, it's more like 70 than 58. That means that virtually seven of every 10 non-Orthodox Jews are being very comfortable falling in love with and marrying and creating homes with people who are not Jewish to begin with. Some of them are going to create Jewish homes with them, and a lot of them are not. And in past generations, this is not the first time the Jewish community has bemoaned the extent to which there's not enough Jewish content and Jewish education and Jewish identity. Even in some of the eras that we now idealize, there were rabbis writing about how difficult it was to get young people to be involved in Jewish life. And very often, it was only anti-Semitism, which re-energized Jewish life, which Jew drove Jews back to, to uh, Jewish life. We live in America where it is so open that all of our children, all of our children, including people who are in the Orthodox world, are free now to fall in love with and to become friends with anybody and everybody. And in the non-Orthodox world, there's no question that we, their parents, have encouraged them to have an embracing total mm -hmm connection with anybody of, of, from anywhere, of any religion, any color. And lo and behold, our kids found people that they fall in love with. And once you fall in love, it's, it's done. And I don't see the comparable, any comparable movement or historical twist that would somehow drive a great number of Jews back to their Jewishness. And in I think sometimes we in the New York area don't realize how atypical this New York corridor is of Jewish life. And when you go outside New York, it's the letters I get all the time from all over the country. It's hard to be a Jew in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank God for Shalom TV. You give me a sense of Jewish community. That's really what's going on everywhere. Mm -hmm. And the modern Orthodox, according to this study, are only 3% of the totality of us, only 30% of the Orthodox world. Most young people who are modern Orthodox are in the minority of the, of the minority of the minority. So I am saying to the four of you, I want Jewish life to continue. I want the Jewish people to continue because I think that what we are and the values we have and the sense of Torah, let alone that we have a right just as a people to be. I want it to flourish. You know, it's why I do Shalom TV. But and yet I'm trying to be as honest with myself, as realistic with myself. I find a lot of mistakes in the Pew Report, and it's probably because I don't know how to read it right. But irrespective of the Pew Report, just my experience, which is now has a national cast to it because of where Shalom TV is all over the country, makes me very, very worried that in some way, it's sort of like what Steve said, you know, the game is over. And now we're just trying to tread water and hold on as long as we can. And I am basically an optimistic person. I wish I had your I just sense. Don't, I don't have, I don't know what's going to be in the future. I just don't feel it's a smart stance to be so pessimistic. It's, it's not it's about smart. No, I'm telling you, I feel it's strategically stupid to be so pessimistic. And there's a lot of things out there that the Pew study doesn't show us that are important to take into consideration that haven't been mentioned. For instance... The rise of Jewish studies, which was not something that was supported by the Jewish community. The rise of Jewish studies on campus 
there are the Association for Jewish Studies was started in 19 late 1960s 69 yeah so now it has you know I don't know 2,000 people coming to a conference every year and on you consider that on campus which is where every Jewish kid goes to practically you know, how many kids don't go to college who are Jews 10 percent okay but that is a regular watering hole Jewish kids go to college and I don't know from this study, but from the 1990 study, the NJPS, whatever its problems, it said that among people who were in college, that 41% of them took courses in Jewish studies. That's a thing. There's Jewish movies. There's books. There's all kinds of things that are not products of the Jewish community that are available in America in the shared space. There's stuff from Israel. There's Israeli culture. Uh, that the more it's exported, the better. The more we make of, and on, not to speak of all the online things that are out there, these are not the traditional routes for going back to Judaism. I think we ought to be going forward to Judaism, to new ways that it's evolving, new points, that it, new distribution channels that it might have, new products, new distribution channels. Uh, I'd like, and the more I see, you know, young literate interest, and, and literacy matters. It's, we, we, I don't want to see a thin Judaism. But the more I see literate young rabbis and educators going out and, and artists and others trying to create something, the more there's going to be something to buy that, that may be something we don't know um, that's new on the horizon yet to be seen. And that's the kind of thing um, that I'd, I, I'd I... I'd like to bridge both of your positions. Um, I think it would be quite silly not to worry. In other words, if it doesn't keep you up at night, I think that's really problematical. That invites a kind of complacency that is unwarranted. Mm -hmm. But that said, uh, what Bethany is pointing to is part of, uh, part of the American Jewish narrative of the last 50 years. Jews have more opportunities in America for an intensive Jewish life, what she would call a thick Jewish existence, yeah. than they've ever had at any moment in Jewish history, frankly, uh, you know, going back to Roman times, if you will. The question is, will more Jews avail themselves those opportunities? Mm -hmm. now, and what will it lead them to do when it comes time to create families of their own? You have been one of the champions who keeps saying that the intermarriage rate is a problem which we don't address properly. The Jewish community has basically said it's now okay for Jews to and marry non-Jews. I've said that as a real problem. And yeah. you have said, okay, and my problem is I, I love all these things. I love Limut. I loved, I, I, I was fortunate enough to be one of the first professors, uh, teachers I should say, at a Jewish studies program on, on college campus with Yitz Greenberg. I want, I want every child Jewish who goes to college to study in a Jew, but I don't see it translating at the moment into what you have identified as the most important index of the Jewish future. That's, that's, that's where I think we just need, <coughs> we need to re-examine. We don't need to devote so much attention to making Jewish life better mm -hmm. and Jewish communities more meaningful. It's, it's very counterintuitive. We need to devote more effort, which means money, into recruiting more Jews to partake of Jewish contexts, ones that, I've, that, I've been, that, we've, all been, that we've all been mentioning. Almost all of them marginally increase the Jewish involvement rate immediately and then 30 years later. We have studies that, that, that show this. So, Loba Shemaimi, it's, it's, not, it's not in the heavens. Loba Meiver Hayam, actually it is, Meiver, it is across the sea. Israel is, part of the, is part, of the, part of the answer. But it's not, it's not rocket science. It's not climate science. We already know more or less what works. We just don't have enough people doing what works. So let's get more people doing what works and then have our philosophical discuss discussions afterwards. I'm more of a radical than this. The, the way you're going to get people to buy into Jewishness, and it's true um, of non-Jews too, is you offer the very best of daycare, of uh, early childhood things, a great education. People are going to want to go to those schools. You get the best progressive school, you're going to get that non-Orthodox uh, population. You'll, you'll be more likely to get them if, if you set up something. that, And you see it at, at the JCC we, we, we in Manhattan. We haven't spoken about this, but Steve knows that I have certainly made family-friendly policies for America and daycare for us. I want as, to make sure that gets as, highlighted. I, I totally agree with you. Uh, it, there's a but. The but is that if I'm... Um, that for, if we can get philanthropists to do that who wouldn't do other things, or people do other things that wouldn't do that, great. If, if someone asked me, 
where do I put my next fifteen hundred dollars? And many of I have to say that either in conversion, because it costs us about two or three thousand dollars to create one convert, or into Jewish summer camp, because it costs us fifteen hundred dollars to induce somebody who otherwise wouldn't go to camp to go to, to go to camp. What I'm trying to say is that in the area of child care, we have a very expensive proposition and we won't address the problem wholesale. I wish we would. We also need, as a community, which is something that we can do wholesale, we need to elect representatives who will enact family-friendly policies and, and have America catch up to Europe, which may raise the American birth rate for middle class, upper middle class people. No, if we followed France that or Israel help. in some of these things, in it the would interim, help. given that's such a long shot, and we should do it, we're going to have to not forget about, and I don't think you were saying that, but not forget about the things that Stephen's been talking about, I've been talking about adolescent Jewish education yeah. well, as well I, as young adults. The point I was adults. trying to make, so I, I, I agree with you, I, I'm but, glad. The underlying right. point is that if you reach people in the things they need in their lives, and you can do that with a Jewish Over connection, it. you will get them. You have to connect with them in their lives. You, the, the message can't be be Jewish because being Jewish is important. No, 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 we agree. It has to be be Jewish because it helps you, because it right. makes your life a better life. I agree with you. We have a great product, but we sometimes frame it as you got to go to camp, you got to go to this, you got to go to that. Somebody who doesn't buy that, I'm, I grew up in camp. I'm a youth group product. I'm a product of every one of these things, and I'm still working for the Jews. But I'm not your problem. But the people who, have, don't, who haven't drunk the Kool Aid yet, aren't going to drink it just because you're bemoaning. You're going to need to get them in practical ways, in the ways that speak to their material Absolutely. and spiritual needs. For me personally, this has been riveting. I cannot thank you enough. Look, the two of you are the ones who sit at this table all the time. As you hear the whole discussion, is there one therefore for you that you could share with our audience? What's the therefore that comes out of this discussion? Well, I think the major therefore is that we have to continue being involved in the Jewish world. And there's uh, no way around it. We have to stimulate and excite and create some sort of dynamic where Jews love to be Jewish. Um, and not force them. You can't force, in this day and age, force doesn't work. Coercion doesn't work. Anti-Semitism doesn't work. And it can't work. But what can work is love, appreciation, and respect for an unbelievably spectacular culture, uh, both religiously and non-religiously. And I think if we build those environments, it's like uh, the movie. If you build it, they will come. I think that in this particular case, the Jewish community has remarkable strength and, um, and I hope a great future, despite, despite the, um, uh, the Pew Studies predictions. And what's the therefore for you? Change communal priorities, challenge Jewish leadership, take this material to the, to the philanthropists, have them change philanthropic norms within the community. Um, we have an enormous opportunity if leadership will step up to the plate. My fear is that uh, we'll see another rerun of 1990. Maybe a few good things will happen. And um, you know, the next time you get a threat coming out of Iran, uh, the entire will be back to business as usual. You know, all of you get to sit in and watch these four extraordinary people share ideas and they bring insights that are generally never we get a chance to hear them so lo and behold they've taken the time and they've given us a lot of time and they've gone out of their way to be here to share their ideas with you i can't thank you enough you know I, I, you and i go way back and i think that what you're doing the work you've done and the positions you take are extraordinary and so i'm very very grateful for the time you gave me bethany this is the first time i'm meeting you it is wonderful i really hope the two of you uh, can sit at this table again. Uh, I appreciate. We're going to be in the nursing home, though. Uh, it'll be. I'll, I'll, I will bring. We will bring all the crew from B'nai Zion <laughs> to the nursing home up in Riverdale. But no, you, you're doing extraordinary work, and I appreciate the fact that you give us so much of your mind and passion. And I thank that very much. And the two of you, you're always by my side. I appreciate very much, Mike and Steve. Kol tuba hatzlacha. And that was Stephen Baim, Micah Halpern, Stephen Cohen, and Bethany Horowitz sharing their insights and analysis of the 2013 Pew Research Center report entitled A Portrait of Jewish Americans. And again, you can see that report and read it yourself if you visit the Pew Research Center's website.
In any case, I hope you found their insights provocative and enlightening. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to this edition of the Chaim. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, or tweet me. I'd love to share your thoughts on a future edition of the program. My thanks to B'nai Zion for hosting this edition of L'Chaim. They do fabulous work on so many social levels for the state of Israel and the Jewish people. And so until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends, to life. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support. L'chaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media.